Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marta, and uh, I'm delighted to host this session and introduce you Soraya Bagat, who will share with us her experience in women's rights and activism. And uh, just a quick look at Soraya's uh, biography to know her a little better. Uh, Soraya uh, is a Finnish Egyptian consultant, a social entrepreneur and advocate for women's rights and tolerance in Egypt. She has a passion for championing cause causes that contribute to society and empower individuals to achieve their goals. She has particular interest uh, in education, capacity building, employability and culture as catalysts for change in society. Uh, Soraya strongly believes in the power of individuals to stand together in the face of adversity and in the power of civil society and grassroots movements to bring about change. And it was this belief uh, that encouraged her to start Tarir Bodyguard, a movement, a movement that, that she will tell us uh, all about it. And uh, it was composed by uniformed volunteers intervening to stop the brutal mob sexual assaults on women in Tari Square uh, in the wake of Egypt's uh, 2011 revolution. The movement successfully intervened in over 100 cases and brought the Tribute to uh, pass, uh, landmark sexual harassment law in 2014. After the protests in Tahrir Square ended, she shifted her attention to other forms of violence and discrimination against women, including female genital mutilation. So, and between 2014 and 2019, she served as member of the strategic advisory group for the Girls' Generation the African-led movement to end female genital mutilation in one generation. She has spoken about women's rights and issues in Egypt locally and internationally, and she uh, received several awards. Uh, she was chosen uh, as one of the women future leaders of the Mediterranean by Science Po University, and one of the young social leaders by the Singapore Summit in 2015 and 2017. And uh, uh, recently, uh, in 2018, she was awarded the Inspire Egypt Award in Gender Equality category by the British Embassy in Cairo following a social media vote. So Soraya will share with us what she has learned about launching grassroots movements, leadership and issues relating to gender equality. Uh, just to remind you, uh, we will uh, listen to Soraya for more uh, around 45 minutes to an hour and then we'll still have one hour to questions and for sharing. So Soraya, the floor is yours. Hello. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you so much for honoring me with uh, your presence. Um, I'm delighted to be here with this uh, great group. I've met some of you over the past uh, two days and uh, love your, your energy. And because of that, I, I will speak today from the heart. Um, I'm here to, sh to share what I learned. Um, and the title of the, the talk, as you might have read, is Learning on the Go. I pride myself that I am an accidental activist in every single way. I come from a corporate career. I wanted to be a CEO. I was a corporate slave working uh, not nine to five, but rather nine to seven, eight, nine. <laughs> um, and never felt that, you know, I could get out of that little, you know, the hamster in the cage that's always running in that little round thing. I never felt that I could get out of it, although I had that feeling that I, there must be more to life. There must be something that we could do. And then, this happened, what you see in the back. An awakening on so many levels. Um, the Harir Square in 2011 was not just a, a political movement, it wasn't just a revolution, it was, it was a change an awakening for so many people in Egypt, especially the young people who'd make their voices heard. But what was particular at, about the revolution was the role of Egyptian women 
So they stood side by side next to men, demanding you know, bread, freedom, justice um, in the beginning, and then the removal of President Mubarak. It's actually been said that it is because of the women that this revolution even was able to, to bring about the ouster of President Mubarak after 18 days because they were just an indomitable force. Um, and this was a change for them because a lot of women prior to 2011, their activism was mainly online. So they were behind the safety of their screens. But in 2011, they took to the streets and they made their voices heard and left a huge impact. So that said, you know, it was quite something to, as a woman, to break so many, you know, barriers and, 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 and go out and make your voice heard. But unfortunately, there was a dark side to this. After the revolution, right after, in the aftermath, there were mob sexual assaults. Women were being systematically um, sexually harassed, sexually assaulted, stripped naked, beaten up. The first case was uh, that came to uh, the to public attention was the case of uh, CBS correspondent Lara Logan, who after the revolution said that the last night, the night that Mubarak was ousted, was subjected to a brutal mob sexual assault that resulted in her being in hospital in New York for five days. It was shocking because, you know, the revolution was very peaceful. It was 18 days of hope, awakening, um, solidarity, a brotherhood, um, uh, sisterhood in the square, and this really was was quite a big shock. And unfortunately, you know, as somebody who was there at the time, um, I was very appalled by the reaction, not just from the press, but from the people. What? How can that happen? How can a woman be stripped naked in the middle of a public square where there are millions? I didn't see it. My friend didn't see it. My other colleague didn't see it. Nobody really saw it. She's trying to get attention. She is a journalist who wants a story. Um, she has no new angle. Mubarak stepped down. What else can she write on? That she's looking for attention. All the things that we hear about women when they come forward. But imagine the trauma that she had to do this in the public spotlight. And in Egypt, the country where she was subjected to this brutal attack, the press started you know, bringing out stories about her past. She had an affair in Iraq. She did this. She what did she wear? And I was also equally shocked by the reaction on the street, the reaction from friends of mine who graduated from you know, international universities, who, um, whom I thought were very open-minded. The three questions. Oh my God, this happened to her? What was she wearing? Number two. Oh my God, who was she with? And how did he not protect her? Was there a fixer? Was there a cameraman? How come, how come he let this happen? And number three, which is really the worst, I think, sometimes. Oh my God, why did she go and report from Tahrir Square if she knows that this can happen to her? So that was the background that I was, you know, in, or this was, the, this was my environment, rather, um, during that period after 2011. I went, and I think it left something in the back of my head that, you know, this is, this is not okay. And guess what? A little bit after Lara Logan's stories, we heard other stories, but they were suppressed by the media. They were dismissed as just, you know, again, hearsay, rumors, the women trying to get attention, etc. And then one year, the one year anniversary of the revolution, I ended up going to Tahrir Square. The same conditions in Tah the, the, as in, during the revolution. Uh, the square is completely packed. You know, sometimes when that square would be packed, they were talking about one million, two million, two and a half million people. So it's like, imagine a huge concert. You don't get to see everything. It's packed. People are pushing. People are shoving. Um, so that's exactly where, what happened that day. And I ended up seeing an ambulance and people rushing. I didn't understand what happened. I was like, you know, has somebody been hurt? And they said, no, we just rescued a woman from a mob sexual assault. And the only way to get her out of the square because the mob is so huge, in some cases 50 men, is that we need to put her in an ambulance because we cannot do it on our own. And again, that was just here. Um, so I continued with my demanding day job to pay the bills. And one day I, I heard about it. I think it was on the radio or something. I heard about two girls who were, again, 
subjected to the same thing, no action from either the government, no activist work that I was as aware of, no civilian groups, and the same thing happening. And I think that day I decided that I've had enough. Somebody needs to do something about this. I'm inexperienced. For God's sake, I'm not an activist. I have a job, I have bills to pay, but I need to do something about this. So I remember and that precise moment when that hit me, um, that I had been driving to work every single day for an hour. I worked for a real estate developer, and I kept seeing, um, as I approached my office, you know, all these men building the, our projects, wearing helmets and vests. So just stuck here. And you know when the stars really align for you? That day, I was thinking, I got this. Every single thing I've ever been through in my life made sense. I am going to be a bodyguard for every single woman that's going to go into the square. If the, the police are not going to send policemen, then I will. If you know civilians won't do anything, then I will. And uh, guess what? What's the fastest, easiest, and cheapest uniform that I could get? Construction helmets and vests. So there was the bodyguard. And I have to say, you know, when you you know when you make that switch, we all have ideas every single day. But the difference is that there's this little switch that goes on in our minds and say, says, okay, I'm gonna, really gonna do this today. I'm really, today I'm really gonna do this. It's not just gonna be another idea. So I had, like a lot of us, we, you know, when you're like, when you're getting on stage, you get that stage fright. I was saying, okay, I'm gonna get on Twitter. And if the name is not available, then khalas, it was just another idea, you know, I'll forget about it, etc. because it's too much, what am I getting myself into? And then I ended up going on Twitter, the name was available and I was like, oh my God, now I really have to do this. Went to the bank, withdrew a thousand dollars, and the rest just kept rolling. Got on Microsoft Paint, and thought, okay, what logo could I possibly, you know, create for this? If it's Tahrir bodyguard, so I decided, you know, on the outskirts of Tahrir, there's a very famous bridge in Cairo um, that has these beautiful lions, and I always felt that they were protecting the square or looking at the square, but they also symbolize the bravery of the men that I needed to find, because hey, I'm not gonna be able to be the, the one Tahrir <laughs> bodyguard. I have to find all these men, you know? Um, so I decided to paint it on Microsoft Paint. So there we had the uniform, the concept more or less, the social media um, account, and you know, uniforms again. So the uniforms, the social media accounts, uh, the logo, the identity, the idea, but there I was in my office, tweeting away, and within an hour, I think we had like over 500 followers, and you know, one of my funniest stories reflecting back is, I wasn't even on the square yet, and I was tweeting saying, you know, we, I can't say, you know, I'm a, an, a woman alone uh, in an office, and uh, <laughs> asking you to join me to, you know, to uh, fight for, uh, for, for women. Um, so I had to say that, we're a group of Egyptians that have come together to fight the mob sexual assaults in Tahrir. Please join us. It started with tweeting safety tips, asking people to send us you know, their bios, their CVs, their, their IDs so that they can be vetted, so that they can volunteer, uh, raising awareness on cases. And that same day, before any of the 200 uniforms that I bought with the $1,000 were filled, I had an email from CNN at 5 p.m. saying, hey, where can we interview you? <laughs> <laughs> Where can we see you? Which I, thinking about that, you know, was uh, was another motivation to really start getting the ball rolling. Now that there was um, interest. Sorry, excuse me for one second. I apologize, but I'm having a very bad case of cold. Sorry, but I have to get it. Forgive me. Where was I? Okay, you are paying attention. I know. <laughs> I just wanted to check. Okay, so, yeah, it was a test. They're they're gonna be uh, watch out. They're gonna be a few more um, during this session. Okay, so I had to f to to do the next big step. Where do I find two hundred men who are willing to be volunteers? Get beaten up from because the mob was aggressive. I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, where do I find these men who are willing to take time off, you know, protect all these women, pretend in very, under very hazardous conditions, possibly, you know, get beaten up, get arrested? Um, 
yeah, that was challenging. So I kept thinking, okay, if things have worked well so far up to this point, in less than a day I get all this done, I can't give up now. There must be something that I can do to get 200 men ASAP. So I started looking in my back black book, who owes me a favor? Who owes me a favor? Who owes me a favor? And then I found that, that person. He was a dear friend of mine who was um, in charge of mobilization, ta-da, <laughs> in one of the political parties that was very respected back then. And, you know, this was, if you followed the news, this was a very volatile period in the, in the history, you know, of Egypt. Um, political parties were assigning responsibilities for the square. One of the responsibilities was, hey, we need to make sure that the demonstrators are safe. So that particular party was in charge of the safety of the square. So I called him up and I said, meet me for a drink um, on the outskirts of Tahrir. And uh, his response was like, what do you want? Because back then, if you invited somebody for a drink, right, you know, a few meters from Tahrir, it meant you wanted something. And then I got the courage and told him, listen, I'm gonna, be I'm gonna go straight to the point. I need 180 men, please, from your volunteers. And I can't give you credit because this needs to be nonpartisan. But one day, um, you know, one day I'm going to speak about this if this is successful, if we manage to together save women from, you know, these mob, brutal mob sexual assaults. I will talk about you and I will give you the credit, but right now I can't. And I just need you to trust me. And hey, number two, I have it on good, uh, you know, authority that um, you guys are in charge of security and tahrir. And what kind of a square is it if women are systematically being, you know, sexually harassed, assaulted, stripped naked, raped, beaten up? So let's work together. And you know what? You can keep the helmets and vests. I, mean, I just have stickers. After this is all over, keep them. You might use them for your mobilizing activities. And um, we had a deal. So when the uniforms finally arrived, uh, a day later, we went with a truck to uh, the Harir Square, they counted the uniform, I, we met the volunteers, we gave them a briefing, we told them what to look out for, we explained to them how important this is, and we were very, very impressed by their level of engagement. They were immediately, yes, we're gonna do this, this is important, we have to take a stand, this cannot continue. And then he was like, hey, th you said 180, but there are 20 other uniforms here. You know, we can get you 20 men. I said, no, actually, I'll hold on to these. Let me try to start this organically. Let me try, I mean, I'm entering, as I said, I'm learning on the go, I'm trying. Let me see if I can get some people. And funny enough, the first person that I met on Twitter was um, this gentleman who had you know, messaged me several times saying, hey, I like this, I want to volunteer. And I met him and I was like, hi, welcome aboard. You're the director of operations, now go run, bring your friends. <laughs> and it slowly started very organically and we ended up, you know, taking the square by storm. So the next time there was a huge demonstration. At that time, just to clarify, to put things in context, the demonstrations were usually on Tuesday or on and, and Friday. So I had started Tahrir Bodyguard on the Tuesday. And with all the hype, um, I felt that, you know, Friday we had to be in the square because we had to use the momentum to not only, you know, intervene in the mob sexual assaults and, and, and save the women and girls being assaulted, but also to raise awareness, to take this opportunity to, to bring this to the forefront and try to bring justice to some of the women who were being assaulted. So it started, and I was surprised because, you know, that first day, all 200 of them in the square, building a little tower, a watchtower, it was just a beautiful sight. Um, and it was crazy that that day we got so much international media attention. People wrote about this. People wrote about the civilians who are taking action. And what I think mattered the most to me was the fact that people were talking about the mob sexual assaults. They talked again about Lara Logan. They talked about the other women who were being um, assaulted, who were assaulted, who didn't receive justice. So that was that was quite something. So I started this very organically you know I had no time to to write uh, a charter I had no time to to, sel to select committees I had no time to write job descriptions I just had to go on with it um, I think in the beginning it just started you know go out run 
uh, save the women. And then I started thinking, well, maybe I should get organized. I started looking at, you know, how police run their units, how military run their units. There's all common sense and learning as you go. Like I had this, I said, well, maybe they will be more effective if um, we divide them up in teams and each team leader, you know, is responsible for recruiting and training, you know, his team. Um, we found ways to, to communicate. We created um, a hotline, which is not really a very sophisticated hotline. It's just somebody's number, and that person would be in charge of, um, you know, disseminating the information. We asked people to tweet to us uh, and call us, SMS us, wherever there was a, an assault. We started learning also to anticipate assaults. So for example, we did a map of the hotspots in Tahrir Square. You know, where were we started mapping out where did the assaults happen? Are there areas or conditions that are more conducive to sexual assaults than others? Um, we discovered that, you know, that one of the problems that happened was that um, although there were assaults during the daytime, most of these assaults happened at night, because Tahrir was not illum illuminated enough. Um, there were areas of congestion where they happened. For example, the entry and exit points of met the metro. Um, there were parts of the square that the, there was a part that had a bit of an indentation. It happened there. So we also would station teams there. So it just happened. And all of a sudden, I think maybe f five months later, my name was leaked for the first time. I didn't understand, I have to admit, I didn't understand what the Associated Press is. I thought it was this newspaper that I never heard about. So when they said, um, we need to write your name so that, uh, to give the story more credibility, and that was the priority, because they wanted to say who founded the movement. Um, and there was a back and forth between me and the journalist, and then he told me his editor absolutely insists on you know putting the name to add that authenticity to the story and he wanted to write about how it had you know developed so organically so i said great nobody reads associated press because i never heard of it anyway so <laughs> i know it's ridiculous um so there boom i woke up the next morning and it was on every single <laughs> it was on every single um news outlet um which was nice because the story got the traction and the, the, my team was also interviewed, and we got to, to speak about this public. But it also, you know, opened a new channel for me. You know, I was this committed a corporate person. Suddenly, people were asking me, you know, to talk about, you know, women's, women's rights. All of a sudden, they're asking me to talk about other areas of women's rights, domestic violence, um, etc. So it just opened this whole new path um, for me, and we utilized that publicity very well by also engaging in other things. One of the things we did was that we organized the march on Women's Day to stand against these mob sexual assaults. We decided to, this is us protecting the, the march, we decided to, in response to the sexual assaults, bring more women to the square, bring more women to the streets, not to have women, you know, silenced by these assaults, just to fight back. And then when we'd have idle moments, when there were no demonstrations, we also decided to do something else. We decided that, you know, we had to also adapt to the changes around us. And one of the things that we did was we started this, uh, these free self-defense workshops to teach uh, women self-defense. So we would just put them out on our platforms, on our social media platforms, and tell women, you're invited, it's free, you know, we need to teach you how to, how to stand up for yourselves. Because, as I said, I entered this, you know, as a newbie, but I wanted, I felt that it's very important that we don't stay idle. That as a movement, we capitalize on the momentum and that we keep on innovating and adapting to the changes around us. And I have to tell you a few things. That I was hit with a lot of criticism at a certain point. You know, I've talked to you about the high. So you've had that, you know, 15 minutes of fame, you've had that success, it's, it's exciting, it's thrilling. But then, you, you know, you hit reality. I met a lot of the, you know, great women and men who had been working on women's rights, women's rights in Egypt for 20 years. They weren't very, you know, welcoming in the beginning. Some of them were not very thrilled. Who are you? You were like, what, you're like five months old. What are you doing on the table? And then I realized that I had two, two choices. To be upset by 
being snubbed and criticized, or to actually develop very thick skin and you know, embrace my seat on the table, take it by force, sit on the table and learn from them. So I remember we had friction points that I had, you know, because of my lack of experience when it comes to women's rights activism, don't even know the jargon, I had said that we are a group, a, it has to be a group of men on the ground, that you know, women volunteers would do the typically female stereotypical jobs, which are um, the social media, the reporting, the, mobil the organizing, the mobilizing, the fundraising, you know, the cute <laughs> um, stuff, whereas the people who would intervene would be men. And immediately I got very criticized that how could you talk about women's rights and gender equality when you are creating a gender difference? You're not emphasizing that women are equally capable, like men, to take to the square and, and, and defend other women. So I, ha I had to learn. I had to learn. It took me a while before I was able to listen. Um, and I think that's one of the lessons that I've learned is that you, it hurts when you feel that you're on the right track and you're, you're, you're getting you know, the success and you're making an impact and you're, you're developing a passion for, some, for something, it hurts when you know, you're told when you're sitting at the table that, hey, you don't get it, you don't know, etc. So I think humility is, is definitely one of the things that I, um, that I learned from this experience. Also, another thing I remember was that I also was open to being corrected. In our social media, in our texts, in our interviews, we always talked about the victims. No. The people who were more experienced in the field told me, we don't call them victims, we call them survivors. And I started, you know, really learning on the go. And I guess if, 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 you, if you don't put your ego aside, you miss out on an opportunity to really develop. Then, of course, they started teaching me about, you know, um, this whole discourse on women's empowerment in general. What is women's empowerment? Some people tell you that you don't need to talk about women's empowerment because women, women are already empowered. They just need to find the opportunities and you know, break the barriers that, enable, that prevent them from practicing their, um, their power. So it was quite a thrilling ride, but it came to an end. Um, I got to recognize in Cairo. I came to an end. I got to recognize uh, I started a movement very fast. I hadn't written things down. It was just, you know what, the first few committed people who joined were like my core team. I called them the core team, the executive committee. I didn't have time to vet, I didn't have time to design, and um, this is something that I will come back to later in my talk because I would also like to share with you the more specifics, because I also come from an HR background, corporate background, of how do you also manage your movement when you start it? I ended up losing my movement because I didn't you know, have the time or the foresight to understand that even though it's like go everything's going well and we're all like best friends, that you know, when you run a movement, even if it is a volunteer-based movement, you need to have structure, you need to have policies, you need to have something. It can't just be completely organic. Um, and that's, I guess, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned from, from this experience. Um, when I, I remember that um, one of the things I've always wanted to do when I was younger was be on CNN. Because I was watching CNN when I was like six years old. And I was obsessed. So when CNN came knocking the door, really, again, asking if they can interview us, I had a decision to make. Do I fulfill my dream and get on CNN? And hi, mom. Or... Do I use this opportunity to give the, it a platform to the actual people who are really doing the work, the, peop the men who are on the square risking their jobs, risking their, you know, their, their safe well-being, um, etc. So I chose the latter. I actually told them, I, please, I don't want to be interviewed. I'm very happy standing in the background and um, having someone else uh, talk. So we had a bit of a democratic, you know, they saw that I had this de very relaxed democratic attitude. Yes, I founded the movement, but hey, you know what? For this big interview, the biggest we've done, please, you, you go ahead. Or you guys choose someone from amongst you. Um, so that said, whenever somebody, one of them would say, hey, I'm a co-founder, I was extremely relaxed because, 
okay, we're all best friends and we're doing something great. But that backfired because there was the biggest show in the history, TV history of the Middle East. It was a friend of mine and actually he was a, he's a political satirist and he's, he was one of the first people who supported me when I started this movement and had promised that he would do an episode of his widely popular show, which is by the way, it's like a political satire. Um, and so it was very difficult for me to understand how he could adapt an episode specifically to talk about something as horrific um, as the mob sexual assaults because there's nothing funny about them. Um, but he did deliver on his promise and five months later, he said, hey, I have a surprise for you. Uh, I want to do this episode and I would love it if you know you could come on the couch together with another person from a similar movement to Tahrir Bodyguard and let's talk about your work in the second half of the, uh, of the show. And the first one, we will laugh at the stereotypes. We will laugh at the people who you know, can't understand that um, the, what you wear has nothing to do with what happens to you as a woman. The people who are still placing all these burdens and stereotypes on, and, and barriers uh, on women. Um, so he did the episode and um, before filming, I said that I told the team, hey, I have exciting news. I'm, I'm gonna be on the show and I think I'm gonna invite you all and all, all that stuff and uh, he's gonna honor everybody. And the question was, why you? We're all co-founders here. And didn't we vote uh, last week for this person to be the spokesperson for the foreign media and this person to be the spokesperson for the, for the local media? I'm like, yes, but um, he wanted me because you know I founded the movement, hello, that day when I was in the office that I just talked to you about. No, honey, we're all co-founders here. We're all co-founders here, we're all equal, sorry. Plus, we don't really think that you got what it takes. You're, you, we, don't, we think that he will do a much better job and it sends a stronger message when he speaks. I'm like, yeah, but my friend said he wants me. And the message was clear, you could have never done this without us, which I couldn't have major friction. So I went in tears to my friend, the, the presenter, and I said, I'm, I'm having a big problem. You know, I can't, I, if I do this, I'm gonna lose my movement, etc." And he told me, listen, I'm gonna make it easy for you. If you're not the one sitting on my couch, I'm not gonna interview anybody because you have to learn to fight back for what you've done. Yes, that you wouldn't have been able to do it without the help of, of, of your group but you also need to assert that you started this. You know, sometimes we lose ourselves because again, the lack of structure, etc. but you need to stand up for yourself. So I did it. Um, I asked him to honor them, to ask them to stand, to get them on, you know, not really on stage, but to get the camera to um, focus on each and every one. We had a honeymoon for like maybe two weeks. And when the episode aired, we started having fiction. We need to have elections to choose a CEO. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, I thought that I founded the movement, so I am CEO. Oh no, it's a democracy. And it just, you know, continued. So long story short, I found myself in my movement talking more about the things that I had seen as petty and small, such as who the, uh, who, who's the leader, who's this director, who's the CEO, who gets to be interviewed, when there are women being still systematically, you know, sexually harassed and raped and stripped naked and beaten up and all that stuff and going to hospitals. So the situation became so impossible for me that I had to make a very, very, very difficult decision. I had to walk away because it was either this or the, the, the raison d'être continuing, the women and the girls in the square. So I share this with you with a very heavy heart um, because I, I think it might benefit some of you uh, to hear the other part. Because if you Google the story, you know, it's the, the, the old story is always up to that nice part where, you know, we saved the women and uh, everybody lived heavily ever after and all that stuff. Um, but it's also important to acknowledge that I had to take that decision shortly before the movement uh, ceased to be functional. And I cannot describe the pain. It felt like losing a child. But I had to do it. I had to do it. A lot of my friends tell me that I should have stayed and fought back and, you know, changed the passwords and all that stuff. But I did it. I sent the email that, you know, guys, if 
this is you know what's going on then i will take a step back because what's important is that we focus or you focus on the work that we need or you need to do we need to do this we need to fight back within a minute of that email the passwords were changed for everything All the twitter account that i started in, in the office that day the gmail the facebook i lost my movement horrific especially you know how with how much the movement was appreciated by you know civil society um the press i was still receiving requests to speak and suddenly it felt like you're you know you've you've lost something huge you've lost yourself you've lost lost your heart i had to to really grieve and um this was a very difficult period but i decided that i once the grief is over that i have to be strong i felt that you know we all have to know that we are bigger than anything we create no matter how big it is it's not about the recognition it's not about the attention so then starts the second part of my journey of the story once i once i made the decision that i was going to survive and that what mattered was the awakening that happened inside me as a person that i wanted to continue fighting for women's rights i was able to really move on so i learned four things from my experience number one please don't be a, you know a prisoner of your success of your previous success because i can't imagine everywhere i went for maybe two months afterwards so what's the exciting new project there must be another sexy idea that you have huh? so how are you going to top this one i hard as i tried i couldn't find the inspiration really i couldn't find inspiration it's very hard how do i top this one this was successful this was you know it happened you know on the, the, my first go that i was lucky people you know try for excuse me people try for like you know several times before they hit something that goes viral and successful and you know gets you international media recognition and an international network how do you top that and you know what i realized that i wasn't able to come up with an idea because of that pressure because every time i went i would get that question and when i'd go home and think of what am i going to do next because the activism bug had hit me i'd find myself unable to think of a sexier idea so you know what i did i decided to serve which is lesson number two. if you find an opportunity to serve that's what i learned if you find an opportunity to serve and you're able to by all means go it's not about you it's not always about you so i decided to to apply somebody told me hey listen we know it's not your area but um, there is this new project it's an african led movement to end fgm in one generation and they were looking for a non compensated uh, you know board member strategic advisory group member to work on this would you apply and guess what i applied and i learned it opened a whole new door i wasn't working on on female genital mutilation at all i learned that one in five women around the world who has been who's been cut is from my country egypt there's a lot to be done i'm just not going to get the attention and the press that i had you know gotten but who cares i can serve and it opened so many doors for me and here i am after my grieving period giving a lecture and facilitating a workshop for 40 new people that we trained young people that we trained to go to their communities and try to combat this just to put the problem in perspective you know what the percentage of cut women is in Egypt? I'm going to give you exactly the, the I'm going to give you for the age group from between 14 and 17. It had it has gone down from 72% to 68%, which is a hell lot of, you know, and it's a big number. Egypt is 100 million people. It's a huge number. Um so this door opened when I decided to put the ego in check and just focus on what matters, the activism for women. And I was able to, to travel, you know, here I'm in Kenya, to travel to other communities in Africa and learn from them how they ended um, FGM. And it was very interesting because it was another journey of learning on the go, if you will. I learned again that um, uh, why was, were the many campaigns that were done over the past few decades in Egypt not successful is because the rhetoric did not work with the people because you know fgm is a very horrific thing so if you're doing an ad or a campaign 
people cringe because most of the campaigns would be um, this uh, on TV for, would be um, this stereotypical scene of a father bringing the midwife and the daughter is crying and you know she's she's locked in a room and then the father has a change of heart or his conscience awakes and he storms in and runs breaks the door and carries the girl in his arm it didn't work so instead what we tried to do was to change the narrative it was like instead of like you know putting the, the knife out there in the video or uh, reminding people how horrific it is well why don't we remind them of the potential of the uncut girl why don't we emphasize the idea that girls are beautiful and wonderful and have so much potential um, and they're a source of joy and they are empowered the way they are and they complete the way they were born so why don't we celebrate their potential why don't we focus instead of like focus focusing on cutting them why don't we focus on how we can help them recognize their potential develop them further how can we you know work on programming that enables them to become whatever they want to become and break the you know taboos and barriers so that that opened a whole new journey for me and I found peace when I was able to be part of this, this, this journey and forget the trauma that I felt by losing my movement. And then something else happened. I decided to talk about my failure, <laughs> which, because I had been at that point, I had you know, been invited all over the world to talk about our story. People liked it, it resonated with them. But I decided that, you know, there was a part two that also needs to be told. It's a lesson that people need to learn. So I've traveled um, around the world to, to also talk about what can you learn from, from, from setbacks. So number three is teamwork, teamwork, teamwork. It's so nice to be part of a team. Um, two years ago, I, I entered the team with UN Women, a, a team of advocates. And jointly, we've started a lot of campaigns. There is, when they sell you strength in numbers, it's not just, you know, this, this thing that they say. It's so nice to not just be, you know, focused on yourself and what you get out of your activism, but also how you can complement the activism of others. So we are part of this group that's the UN Women um, Arab States Agora, where we try to support each other and push each other forward. Which leads me to lesson number four which is when they say that strong women support each other and empower each other, that is so true. I've learned that if I have any opportunity to support the project of another woman that could be even more successful than Tahrir Bodyguard, then I should definitely go for it. And in fact, I'm sitting here because another woman recommended me, Julianne, um, who is part of uh, the Reshape Network, recommended me because we had met at, a, at another event so it's by, you can't just be an advocate for women and focus on yourself. If you're a true advocate for women, then you also focus on giving other women opportunities, support, in the, uh, celebrating their achievements, because when we celebrate the achievements of one woman, we're celebrating the achievements of, of many others. Um, so yeah, I think we're, I'm about to wrap up um, and just say that it's been a ride. I'm still learning. When I left my movement, I thought that was it for me. I'm so glad that I didn't give up. And if there's one thing I would like you to remember from my talk today is that Tahir Bodyguard wasn't even my best idea. The only difference is it's the only day I decided to really act on an idea. So if any of you have ideas, which I'm sure are like brilliant, and we, we all get hundreds of ideas every day, I beg you to please just follow your idea with all your heart and conviction. And I promise you, the whole world will follow, follow back. Just remember me sitting there in an office, completely alone, without anything. The only thing is that I really wanted to do this and I believed in it. And in the end, I will leave you, the HR woman in me will leave you with this chart that I designed for how to start you know, your, your organization. So if you have an organization, it's so important to map out the, the, the organization and have like you know an org chart to understand who does what. And I can send it to you guys, if you like, in high res. And I can leave you my email as well. If anybody has any questions on HR for NGOs or for movements, I would be very happy to support you uh, with some pro bono consultancy. So, you know, starting 
with mapping your organization, you know, and then you, when you do that, you get a detailed org chart. You need to know who does what today, tomorrow, and after. So you ideally map an, uh, an organization chart for now, for where you think your movement will be when it grows in a year, and also your ultimate five years. And why does this help you? It's not just about dividing up, makes you help the think uh, how you divide the labor or the tasks, um, etc. No, it also helps you understand where you're going to promote, you, when you're going to promote your, your, your team members and how. It gives room. For example, some people, like in, I see this mostly in startups or in like very new NGOs, they'll give somebody chief marketing officer. Okay, where does he go from here? You start with manager, then director, then you know, VP. You start, you have to give yourself room. And the second thing is having your policies, you know, your company organization policies are very important, just writing them out. I know it's tedious, but in the long run, it helps you so much. And then having, writing your job descriptions. Writing who does, what, what is the profile of the person? What are their responsibilities? What do they do? And then comes the important part of the, you know, objective setting. Setting objectives for people so that you can manage performance. Then you have to do also evaluating jobs, evaluating titles. You have to do this per periodically. And it's a very good opportunity to do that when you are working on objective setting and performance reviews, etc. And then a compensation review. How much are you paying compared to the market? And are you incentivizing people enough? Some people like to have just salaries. Others like to have salaries and performance-based bonuses. Um, and then finally, the last step, is designing your competency model. What kind of people do you want to have in your organizations and how do you want to develop them? Because a competency model that emphasizes, for example, you know, um, teamwork or creative thinking will help you as an organization to um, move forward and to also focus if you're training employees or you know, um, colleagues, then which trainings do you choose for them? You have to, so that's like if you can imagine like a yardstick or a ruler, that's it. That's your competency model, and finally you're ready to to operate. So thank you very much for being here today. I loved speaking so openly with you. I hope that um, some of what I've said might be useful. And again, if you want to reach out to me to ask me about uh, anything related to or you know organization charts and setting up companies or or uh, NGOs, I'd be more than delighted to help you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Soraya. Uh, thank you for sharing with us such an inspiring experience and for being so honest about the success and the failures of your experience. Uh, I, I, I guess there will be a lot of questions, but I will start with one from my own. Uh, um, how do you, do you think this, um, you conciliate uh, your two worlds as an activist for gender equality and as uh, your work at the corporate level? How this influence, one influences the other? How do your uh, uh, concerns, your positions about uh, gender equality also influences your, cho your choices and your attitudes? in the corporate level. Yeah. Well, I'll start with how the corporate career influences the, the advocacy and activism, which is uh, what I mentioned, is that, you know, in a corporate career, you have more rigidity, you have models like this, etc. So I think that, you know, in light of also what I experienced with my own movement, I have become convinced that some sort, you know, professionalization of, you know, your movement is of vital importance. It saves you many headaches. So that's how that influences that. Perhaps also the corporate career has helped me by giving me access to some corporations that could fund me. Uh, or some understanding of how, you know, corporate social responsibility departments and managers think. You know, what do, how do they choose to fund this project versus that project? Um, what kind of reporting requirements do they want when they fund you, for example? So that was, that was very interesting. It also taught me about the barriers um, uh, that women face until today, you know, we're close to 2020 and still all over the world we have, you know, barriers in corporate life um, and I might address that later. But um, I think 
what's what's interesting about reconciling both words is that I've learned that you can be a champion for women wherever you are, even in the most rigid um, corporate structures. So I decided to, to in my company, to be that champion for women, to continue my advocacy. I can't just, you know, be here and talking about wanting to to help bridge the gender gap and fighting for women's rights and not myself adapt this in my day job. So, for example, I'm, we were one of the first people to ever have, I know this sounds ridiculous, but uh, we don't have a paternity leave in Egypt. And I felt that, you know, one of the things that we can do to emphasize gender equality is not necessarily by always doing policies that are centered on women. Well, why don't we do it the other way too? Why don't we emphasize the fact that, well, men have a responsibility towards their children as well. So we, we, we started this thing where, you know what? Congratulations on the baby. Go home for one week. Help your wife or your partner. And um, that's it. Don't go sit in a cafe. You know, you're staying home and you're changing diapers. And that was our way to emphasize this gender equality. There were other policies, of course, you know, such as uh, daycare, uh, starting a daycare to enable women to come back to work, extended uh, leaves, uh, flexible working hours for women. Also, another very important thing, which is, um, and not many companies still do this, and, and it's very important to, to emphasize this, is the cost that women pay compared to men when they're out of the workforce to raise their children you know you come back after four years or three years your colleagues have been have been promoted and there is no room for you so it's important also as companies to ensure that you keep you keep you know you you keep track of um, your employees who are on maternity leave and that you consider their career path and what they're going to do next so yeah you can be a champion for women everywhere Thank you. So now it's your turn. Do you have any questions or sharing? I don't know if. Thank you, Soraya, for sharing all this with us. I really admire what you do, and uh, as well as your honesty in uh, sharing with us both sides. Uh, and because you were honest, I'll ask also an honest question, and I hope I don't... It's, it's not a negative criticism, it's a true, honest question. Of course, we learn on the go, all of us learn on the go. But w I think you didn't mention, I don't know how old you were in 2011. Uh, I was... Oh my God, I have to do some math now. <laughs> and I'm very bad at math. I mean, were you... 27, 27. The thing you didn't mention is that perhaps when we start something, one of the steps also is to go to see who's already doing something about it and try to learn from these people before we get into the field. Um, I'm not saying they are um, an authority because many times people, I believe that people who have worked for a very long time in a field, somehow they can get trapped as well. But nevertheless, they do give us some basis to start on and then we can do differently even. Thank you so much for bringing this up because you give me the opportunity to clarify a little bit more. Uh, I agree with you totally. I, as a person, I think that um, we should not, you know, reinvent, try to reinvent the wheel when there are already people working. Just to clarify, Tahrir Bodyguard started because I had no choice but to start it because there was no one else doing the same thing. That's why, if I can clarify a little bit about the model that we did, that's why I didn't get into the other areas where people were working. So, for example, there were people, there were, there were organizations that were terrific that specialized in the trauma. So, I had a division of labor because I understood that there are others out there who specialize in counseling for survivors of sexual assault, who specialize in, you know, trying to prosecute cases or bring for, forward, um, you know, the perpetrators to justice that I didn't enter that part. I entered the part that was very vacant, where no one else, no, before we started Tahrir Bodyguard, no one was doing anything to save the women because it was too dangerous. And I had to repeatedly tell my team, you end, your job ends when you hand her over to the ambulance. Others will take it um, from there. So I hope this clarified, but I definitely agree that we shouldn't duplicate 
because it's a waste of energy, and we should try to capitalize on synergies to be more effective. Um, and that's why in my advocacy, I try to either support existing organizations and you know partner with them, or start something new. Like, for example, when I went into the area of FGM, there are so many people working on FGM, but what was nice about the, you know, being with the girl generation and being responsible for Egypt was that it was a communications platform. It was an organization that tells other organizations, come, join us, we will give you training, we will give you a platform. And so thank you so much for raising this issue because I think I might have not clarified it enough. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you so much for this presentation and I also enjoyed a lot your, your honesty about actually your personal story about how you went from, from the first experience to the others. Uh, I find fascinating the end actually uh, because I did not expect uh, the, the, the conclusion. Uh, somehow I feel that your story at one point was leading to a very different kind of conclusion in the sense that uh, it gave me the feeling that uh, you kind of um, reached the, the conclusion for yourself that a movement needs a different type of um, coordination and facilitation in order to be, for you to feel included, while actually at the end you, you seem to find yourself in a position where you, you put the lens of uh, corporate managerialism over the movement, which personally I find a bit strange, and I'm saying this uh, comparing to my own work. I'm a researcher in cultural management, and I'm working now actually on this guide about local networks. And in doing that at European level, uh, to, I mean for a European institution, but at local level. <laughs> and in doing that, uh, I've taken both perspectives. One is about social anarchy and what we can learn from social anarchy principles on how to facilitate and coordinate a movement, a local network, uh, a type of organizational creature uh, which is different to the way we are used to run our daily lives, you know, via organizations, versus the perspective of managerialism, which is exactly somehow what you are proposing, which is more on a new public management stakeholder theory, which actually comes from the profit sector, which very, which much more rigid lines, which a different type of management competence and my own conclusion is that this type of, uh, of structure does not actually work for the type of organizational creature which is, uh, which is represented by a local network. And I do not have experience with movements, as, uh, as you called it, uh, but somehow I would, my instinct would be that um, this type of reasoning and this type of formalization of a management, of a movement, again, um, is, uh, is, um, is ossifying uh, a type of fluidity of communication and organization which comes from, which has a, a drive in a different type of energy. And I would, I mean, it's just my comment on, on your presentation because actually at the end I felt that you would reach this conclusion that, you know, personally I felt that I need to let go, I attach myself too much to this movement, that movement has a life of its own and I'm, I'm going to another story to be involved in, but you actually reach the conclusion that you need more corporate, um, more corporate frames in order for it to work. So, Maybe you can comment a bit on that because I, I, I'm, I'm sure I would, or I would suspect that you also had this, uh, these dilemmas uh, during these years. And how did you come to, to think that this is actually the solution and not uh, the social anarchy governance uh, type of um, answer? I don't know if I made myself clear, but you know. Yes, it's yes. Uh, I actually I got it, and I appreciate your your comment very much because it's definitely an interesting, you know, dilemma that I still have. Just to clarify. I don't propose this as the solution for every, every movement. Mm -hmm. I think when I look back now, I should have had a hybrid. I should have had something in between where I had been more assertive also as a, um, as a leader. And let me ask you a question here, quick survey. How many of you think I should have left and how many think I should have stayed and fought? Just out of curiosity, how many think I should have stayed? Should I have left? Right, did I do the right thing by leaving?
think it depends. It's not black or white. It depends what what was maybe at that time it wasn't really clear for you, but. What do you wanted from that movement? Was it the impact or was it you leading on something? And it's human, I'm not criticizing. All of us that have this leader somewhere and the different leadership, some want to be in the front. Other leaders, for example, i give you an example. When you talk about Microsoft, you know his, there is a face, there is Bill Gates, but nobody knows who's the leader behind IBM. That's different leadership, so, you know, and at some movement, yeah, a different leadership. Nobody knows the guy behind it because he doesn't care, but maybe for him the impact is how much money he got in his pocket. So it, the, 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 how the movement should be shaped, how it, um, it should be used, there is not a, a preset recipe. It's what is meant behind it, what's the life and the, the development that you want to see through that, and based on what you want it to be, then you could choose the best management between brackets uh, structure for it. I agree, I don't think that there's one set formula, but what I personally learned from my experience was that I needed to have a little bit more structure. So I think ideally for me, it would be something between where I come from, the corporate world, and the very loose thing that I had. I mean, I had, I had nothing. I mean, I really, I had nothing on paper. I had my accounts taken from me like this in one minute. I had nothing. I had no claim to anything. So I think um, that it's a dilemma that I still have. Thank you very much. I wish I could give you like a more, you know, assertive answer, but the, the answer that I have is that I'm still learning. Um, I haven't founded a movement since then, or a company. I have an idea. I'm starting one very slowly, but I'm starting it very carefully. And I'm making sure that I at least put in, a fo you know, a part of a, a structure that will prevent, you know, what happened to me, that I can learn from my mistake. And one thing I'd like to add to you also is, you know, there are structures, there are processes, there are policies, but also more important is the term culture. You know, what kind of a culture do you actually build in a company? Um, and the culture that I have always believed in is a culture of participation, um, of teamwork, and um, finding you know, that balance between the necessary regulations, but also that kind of environment where you thrive and you feel that you, know, you have ownership. I just wanted to add to this because this is a very good question and I know, uh, well, myself, I went through it and I know colleagues who set up things and then they had to go through that decision. What do I do? I stay or I leave. And I think the model, the, the model is more than one exactly, and it depends a bit on the context of each one, the kind of person you are, the mission of the structure you created. But you didn't create a formal structure. Nothing was, and I think you did the right thing. And I believe also, uh, you did the right thing if you felt also that you didn't have support in that group. If, um, if uh, they were really eager in saying, we are co-founders, all of us, and there were not some people in that group saying, yeah, but she did it, and we'll go after Can her, I just we'll, we'll support her. I, it was a 50-50, and you, you know the famous story? So, no, it was 50-50, and the problem is what? You remember that famous story, I don't remember who it was, but when, um, I think it was King King Solomon when there was a child and two mothers were fighting over the child and one said, you know, we'll cut the child in two and the other one said no. Well, you know what? I didn't want in fighting. It's very simple. It was, again, about the mission. It was about the cause and that's what mattered to me more. So I was happier to let go. But it's, I think it's maybe important that I add that it was 50-50 because that puts you know, the dilemma more into perspective. Because in my case, it was 7 to 70 and then I had no doubt what I would do, that I would keep to the thing we had. What did you do? Uh, sorry, uh, w uh, we stayed and fight, but we were many, there were just very few that were upset about the visibility I was getting for being the person who would be more visible, that's it. Visibility visible. But then, yeah, there were, it depends very much on the context. I don't think there is a recipe here, although we've been discussing recipes, there's no recipe. I'm actually personally very glad to hear this because, you know, having gone through that, it's always nice to hear that someone else also had the same issue and, and fought back. Um, the use of vocabulary, um, when you talk for, you bring the, the, the corporate rigidity. I know NGOs that are much more rigid 
than the corporate. I've been, I worked on both sides, and I NGOs, NGOs, EU, whatever, <laughs> UN, and I can tell you some and NGOs and internationals are, have the same exact process in here. So it's rigidity, not, not, it's not necessary from the private sector, and the fluidity and transparency is not necessarily coming from an NGO world. So it's first clear. Thank you very much. I just want to add um, uh, about this discussion that uh, maybe it's also about the context. And for me, for example, it is really inspiring because uh, my uh, context, as I'm um, from Poland, and in Poland, uh, activism is really, um, let's say, grounded and connected with this uh, anarchy uh, philosophy. It, uh, it's, um, for me, it's quite inspiring because um, in many activistic movements and also NGOs in our country, um, the philosophy of uh, participation and resist of this corporation models are so strong that uh, when they are starting uh, to grow and uh, to, to, to be more visible, uh, the, the problems with uh, organization starts to be really, uh, really big. And many of movements uh, struggling uh, problems and uh, inner, uh, let's say, um, uh, troubles with communication, etc., and starts to be not uh, effective. And uh, the, 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 mm, this uh, value of effect effectiveness, although we don't like this word because it's connected with neoliberal and capitalistic world, it's, in my opinion, really important about activism because it's about goals and about being, uh, yeah, mm, doing your things, yeah. And uh, what was inspiring in your in your speech for me was that we um, th this this aspect of uh, humility uh, humidity that we can learn something uh, from other other sectors even if we don't share our values for example with uh, um, as, as we are activists and artists we can maybe take something which is connected with the um, uh, management uh, knowledge for example. And uh, nowadays, I just want to add that nowadays in, in Poland we have uh, quite interesting discussions about what we can take from people who are really effective because they are working in business, for example, although, uh, and give them, for example, our values of treating people or uh, anti maybe not, not anti-capitalistic uh, attitude because it's not about business to be anti-capitalistic, but saving our, our attitude to creating world taking something from uh, this organizational position, um, knowledge. So uh, for me, it was really honest you to say that uh, you are from this world uh, and you uh, were grounded in that. And uh, for my, my context, it is insp inspiration because our natural, um, for me, these dilemmas you mentioned were, were so natural and these are my first reaction that, okay, it's, it's, it's not this, this, uh, this world, but still we can, I think we can take something from that. So it, it is really inspiring. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind comment. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again for this great talk. Uh, and I'm from Lebanon, so I do get the context uh, very well. Um, I have also been through something similar, and I did stay and fight, and I did win. And um, I don't, but it still didn't satisfy me even afterwards because, um, uh, and I completely understand the context. And I'm right now actually a friend of mine who started a movement, which is actually the Beirut Pride, is going through the same thing. So I'm trying to advise uh, my friend. And I, when he first came to me saying that he's going to do it, I said, be prepared because shit's going to go down. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering because uh, I also get the whole learning from the corporations. I think that's also very contextual for us coming from the Middle East, not having state that has uh, not having state support, so always feeling like you need to have your own initiatives and be more entrepreneurial and go out there and do things. Um, and now I live for the last two years in Athens, so I'm a little bit more in the European context. And I can't help but think, is it really about creating a system where you can control these things? So that would be like a system that you suggested where you can control things instead of so that you, so that they don't go wrong. Or is it more about, um, 
choosing the people that you work with so that you don't necessarily need to have such a controlling system because after all this time you've learned a little bit more about what kind of people you get along with and if you're on the same values, if you have the same principles and therefore these are the things maybe that you would count on for that not to happen again? Definitely option number two. Definitely option number two first. Yeah, it's about the people. And again, I'm glad that you understand the context because I started the movement um, in 24 hours <laughs> or less, you know, I, I, I think one of my mistakes is that I didn't vet enough the people, I didn't design, you know, the organization better, I didn't think of who would do what and I, instead of bringing all these people and telling them you're all executive committee, you know, I had more people than, than jobs available. Um, so I would definitely go f first with uh, choosing the, the right fit, the people that you can absolutely rely on that you can work with in harmony. Um, and it's not about controlling, it's about empowering and investing in. So yeah, and thank you so much for bringing this question because um, I felt that I wanted to add that. <laughs> thank you. What, can you introduce yourself, please? Maria, uh, I, I live and work in Portugal. I'm Greek, so we mix everything here in a big pot. You know, even if you choose the best people and the people that you think that in a certain moment you think the same way, it might not happen like this. So what we try to do in our case, because it's the human nature, and when things start happening, somebody will be upset because somebody, usually the person who works the most, gets more visibility. It's human nature. So you cannot control everything and everything can get out of, your, out of hand. But there are some things we know that they are being repeated and for instance, in our association statutes, we try keeping a very non-hierarchical, the power was always shared, so there's, there's nobody, even today, there's nobody higher than anybody else, uh, but we did try to keep clear what everybody was doing in that structure, so just to try to minimize the, the, the effect of human nature taking over, that's it. Thank you for sharing that. I did not plan on doing this, but because I'm working on this topic now, I think that there are some things that research has already said that are working if you want to keep alive a local network or a movement. And I'm just going to enumerate some of the things because I've been working yes, on please, this for, please. I think for this one very year. Interesting. So there are some, some types of governance structures that work better than others, and I'm not going to go into this. It's going to be you know, launched next year. Clustering into sub-networks actually works. So actually, if you have a large movement, clustering into sub-networks which are based on theme or on role or on function actually uh, helps the, the, move, the, the network uh, work. Uh, so-called reciprocity norms, meaning that among the people who are part of the, of the, of the thing, <laughs> there should be an agreement on what each of us can do to the other one. So this is called reciprocity norms, which need to be agreed in the first place. Simple channels of communication. This is, I mean, I think it's quite intuitive. Uh, a certain type of identity, so knowing what your values are, what your, what your goal is. Uh, celebration of success, so uh, occasions in which we, 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 uh, the, the people who are part of this are able to celebrate successes, so when something good is happening. A certain type of management competences. So democratic uh, management is something different than uh, the management of a project or, or of an organization. And usually these are skills which are not taught in university. So how to be a good facilitator, how to be a bridger, how to be a connector. This is not something that is usually taught in management school. Also the feeling of a network, what it actually means to feel that we are together. This can be nurtured, nurtured through certain things. And last but not least, the occasion for people to take charge. So um, occasions in which people can say, I want to do this. I want to do the other thing. So these are things not invented by me. These are things which are resulted from reading literature review, doing literature review of, of academic journals and taking interviews with people who have been involved in this. Um, these are just a couple of things, I, I just put them down here, but what I'm trying to say is that even if we look at this from, I mean, the, the lens of managerialism is, can, can function to some degree, but these are actually things which are part of a more, in my point of view at least, and from what I read, these are more adapted to the way 
uh, a network works. And I know you, you called it a movement. I'm sure there are differences between the networks and the, I, I know there are. But these are, I mean, to put it simply, these are different types of organizational creatures, as someone called it in a meeting, than we are used to talk about. And it's, it's a real challenge how to, how to work with them. Um, what, I, 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 what I try for myself, and I want to see in others as well, is, is a challenge to actually do not use, I don't have anything about, uh, against corporate, the corporate word per se, but what I, I, I really think is that we should be careful to apply the lens of managerialism to organizational creatures <laughs> uh, which are not corporate, corporations. And that's all. I mean, sorry for taking the time, but I just felt that this is a good input for the discussion. No, but uh, this was very interesting. No, this was very interesting. Um, and again, I think this you know, has been already said here that um, the context matters. The individual type of uh, organization matters. The individual culture matters. And one's personal experience. We're all, diff you know, we're, it's, you talked about human nature. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and we're, we're all different. I think that, you know, the conclusion that I personally had, you know, received for how I would do it again, um, because there's an also the psychological aspect. You know, if you look at my story, how am I going to trust people without some form of structure again? How can I invest again? You know, somebody was once telling me when I was talking about the high bodyguard and it was like I was gone for like um, I think it still you know I see I get to you either bit when I talk about it <laughs> about leaving you know I had left three months by that time it was like three months that I had left and I was talking to somebody and I had tears in my eyes and I just said I'm really sorry I, I feel so silly you know it's and the person you know had studied psychology and told me no don't be sorry it's like a miscarriage it is painful when you walk away. So I think the, the psychological aspect perhaps might be more, you know, that might be clouding my judgment or affecting me very much that um, to be able to put that energy again, to dare, to start again and inv put my all, because I didn't really sleep. Can you imagine, like when I was growing this movement, I didn't really sleep. It was my everything. It was me. It was everything. So for me to be able to trust again and invest again, I will need to find that balance between the beauty of the organic and flexible with the structure. No, no, I was going to ask what are these people doing today? Oh, um, they fought and split it into two. Oh, they continued fighting. Oh, really, this is human nature. Human nature is really fantastic. So sometimes I advise people, you know what? Just step away <laughs> and watch it unfold. No, they fought. They fought over when you see when the legitimate, and this is also from political science, you know, when they talk about leadership and legitimacy. When the legitimate person who created the movement has, has gone, they had a honeymoon period where everybody's very happy. Hey, the, uh, what was it? Ding dong, the witch is dead from the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> so then the human nature kicks in. And peop leaders who are not legitimate leaders, because who really created the movement when I'm gone? None of them. They, they started fighting with each other and split into two camps. And then the protests in Tahrir ended. And I think it was a matter of months. I mean, it, I left and that baby was gone after three months. It was down the drain. Sad, sad, but you know, I makes me even more glad that I had left when I did. Because I tried my all, I gave it my all to save it. I tried my best to save it by walking away, and I couldn't compete with you know, the human nature. Thank you for your story, and I was just thinking that maybe, because the objective of the movement was, in a way, temporary. So, you either find a new call, or so that, that may, I'm just imagining now, so that also may have been at a moment of reorganizing goals and restructuring the movement itself. I, I, think, I think you did the right decision, so I'm happy you did Thank that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it was temporary. And maybe this is off topic, but I don't really see the tension between the corporate structures and our own little chaoses. What you said, I think it very much reminds me of management uh, tools in a way. And also what I learned from, 
from organizational development that now the corporate world is also adopting some more, some softer structures and softer skills like agile uh, organizations. So they also do talk about that. That's what I know and I also think that our field and I'm studying that really needs a bit of a professionalization and what you said there is just sensible planning. It's, um, I think, very often we just get together with our friends because we have a goal and we never think how we are going to work together and how we are going to deal with conflict. And if that is structured a little bit, I think it helps you on, on the long run. So I, I, I don't think it's, it makes it rigid. It just makes it more transparent and make sure that you are not going to fall out with your friends in a year's time. Thank you for bringing that up. You know when they say, the famous saying, do you know this person? Yes, I do. Have you worked for him? Then you don't know him. Um, uh, when I entered in this room, um, I was wondering how many men would be in your lecture. Um, uh, and um, in France, after the Me Too movement, we had a lot of, uh, we, we have actually a lot of uh, debates about all these things. Then how do you call um, les abus sexuels? How do you say? Sexual harassment, yeah, on women. And then I have a friend, a male friend, um, he, he wrote something very interesting about, um, I know that you speak French, but maybe you could help me. Uh, la parole manquante des hommes. The, the, the missing, the missing, the voice missing of words of yeah. men. Um, because he said that um, when he talks with uh, all um, his uh, female friends, uh, it's about two on three, two sur trois. It's okay. Two out of three. Two. Yeah. Uh, that um, lived some uh, sexual abusement. And, and then um, when he talks to his male friends, anybody did. And when he said anybody did that, uh, you know, non uh, male did that. And then um, the, the numbers are um, showing that uh, a lot of time the abuses are uh, in the next, in the really, uh, th yeah, thank in the you. Close circle, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, so he wrote a very, very clever text about uh, the fact that we need to listen men too on these things and that the, the, um, of course we have to fight for the, the, the right and the, all what you said, but uh, men have also their uh, part of the, of the fight and of the, about uh, say, telling things and recognize. I, I agree with you totally. That's why I'm a big fan of campaigns such as, you know, he for she and campaigns that emphasize, you know, women's rights as not just a women's issue, but it, it is a human rights issue. Everybody should be protected from sexual assault, whether they are, whether they are a, a woman or a man. It doesn't matter. It's about, you know, um, emphasizing that everybody needs to be safe. Gender equality is important. When that equality is achieved, everybody wins. Corporations even um, even win. So sometimes I feel that there's always a focus on women. And maybe that's why I'd mentioned earlier that um, when I started um, seeing myself as a champion for women in my workforce, I also wanted to emphasize the role of men. So that's why I wanted to give them paternity leave to emphasize that they also have a role. Because I'll give you an example. In Egypt, there's a progress when it comes to uh, women's rights. Because suddenly we have uh, a big number of, uh, of female ministers, unprecedented in the government. Like, you know, we had, and just to give you a bit of a snapshot, in 2012, we had nine women in parliament. Today, we have close to 90. We've had, I think, about eight ministers, female, female ministers, if I'm not mistaken. So it's a huge leap forward. But guess what? When some of these ministers were sworn in, people were asking, 
oh my God, how is she going to be, you know, able to be a good minister and a good mother? Whereas when men are sworn in, nobody asks, you know, what kind of a father he is. So I think that this whole idea of fighting for women's rights and gender equality also needs to take into consideration, as you so rightly say, the role that men play and their responsibility aware um, as well. So thank you for bringing that to the attention. More questions? The man in the room, one of the... <laughs> Not directly in response to that. I just want to, I want to take the position of a of a father actually in 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 this conversation. And uh, you know, first of all, uh, and once more, thank you f for the presentation, but also for all of the extraordinary work that you've done. The question I have, is, or the, the the observation I want to make, is that there was a, that was a, a way of making more female survivors. I would say. The, the action, the activism that you took, and I, it, but what it, what what my question is, in having a twelve-year-old daughter, is what's changing the male mentality that allowed that to happen in the first place, and I, th and and I wanted to address that kind of the, the male voice in it. In that, for me, I have a, a daughter and a son, and um, my daughter, I work as hard as I can to empower her to be able to do things like say no and you know to be able to be strong within a situation of a, of a male dominated society with my son i think that is the more important work which is to teach him respect so that that counters a any action that he may come across growing up where male actions result in things like female abuse and the likes and I, I don't know that there's something around that action and the responsibility of men and their sons in order to have the next generation coming up different. Wow, well, thank you very much for your kind words. Um, I think it's two things. It's, you know, from my experience in Egypt, it's two things. It's number one, uh, mindset. Number two, accountability and both really affect each other. One of the issues that you know, faced women uh, in Egypt was the enforceability of laws. First of all, you know, before 2014, there was no real sexual harassment law. There was you know, the rape law in the traditional definition of rape. So if you had been subjected to sexual abuse, if you had been one of the people who was in tahrir, you couldn't really get justice. And how do you get justice from you know, 50 men? It's very hard to arrest somebody um, in that period. Another thing, maybe to put it in context, I've spoken about, you know, FGM. The first time someone in Egypt said, this is not okay, we need to fight it, was in the 1930s, late 20s, 30s, okay? So it's been almost 100 years since the first doctor said, this is not okay, we have to fight it. This was criminalized, I think, 2007, 2008. The first case that was brought to prosecution in Egypt was in 2013, okay? And it was because the girl died. So you have also an issue that, you know, it's not, it's about changing mindsets, but also about enforceability. And enforceability changes mindsets. And changed mindsets support enforceability. Um, some of the, ca the work that has been done was to also emphasize uh, this area that you're talking about that, you know, as a man, you are much more of a man when you empower your woman and your daughter and your mother. And, and there was a beautiful campaign which um, in Arabic is titled Ashen and Aragil. And it was like, because I'm a man, I, I help her in the house so that she can, you know, go on and get her graduate degree. Because I'm a man, I take my daughter to soccer practice because that's what she loves to do. And because of a man, I, you know, stand up for, for, for women's rights. So I think it's both um, uh, together. And we've seen over the past five years in Egypt real change because of, you know, these campaigns and also because the enforceability, you know, there are stories of women who are and men who are refusing to let it go because you know you have to imagine that uh, I'm I was sexually harassed in Egypt several times. It's something you just grow up with, really. Like you know, going to university that's just part of the norm. You know, some people get upset uh, in Egypt when we say that uh, ninety something percent of Egyptian women were subjected to harassment. I don't know friends who have not been subjected to sexual harassment in Egypt. I don't know a single one. 
who can tell me that she has not been touched by a man unwantedly. You know, it's, it's, it's everything. It's even the verbal sexual harassment. Oh, you look hot. So what we've had over the past five years is because of what happened in Tahrir, a trauma, that people started saying that, hey, any form of sexual harassment is not okay. We need to end this. It's exactly, you know, when you have like this uh, dog that you know is a little bit aggressive and you have him on a leash. It's a, it's a cute dog, but that's harmless. doesn't really do anything. It barks here and there. And one day, that dog broke away from the leash and bit someone and killed them. That's exactly what happened in Tahrir. The shock of the mob sexual assaults was that it was that brutal. But hey, women were being sexually harassed every day on the street. You know, we hear the most horrible, like very sexually explicit uh, stuff. So I think it started, you know, with understanding that this needs to end and none of this is okay. And that's why the 2014 law was a landmark because it started, you know, even phone sexual harassment has become criminalized. So that's a way to really enforce it by changing the mindset, by telling people that it is really not okay, and not just that, it is punishable, it's a crime. So, um, yeah, I, as I said, both. Uh, so we are reaching the end of the session. Uh, any last question? No, I'm just putting a last question, just to relate with reshaped uh, project. Uh, based in your experience, what is the role of art in this situation? The role of art is extremely important. You know, it's, um, first of all, art shapes perceptions. It changes, you know, it's one of the things that um, builds bridges between people um, subconsciously, you know, it changes minds, it, it's something, it's more powerful than, than any other medium. Um, in the Arab world, um, the visual arts are very, very important. You know, they call Cairo the, the, the Hollywood of the, of the uh, East because people consume so much TV, TV series. So if we start with ensuring that film and TV productions, you know, theater productions, paintings of women, you know, emphasize gender equality, then we're reaching people faster than anything else because according to statistics that's the one that's that's what people consume the most so it's important to um, also reversely celebrate the great um, female artists we have not just in the arab world but also all over the world and, and put them forward and it was so um, inspiring for me to see that there are these groups that are talking about the importance of highlighting female directors you know because we always hear that you know when you when you look at the oscars for example you see that most people that there are very few women are winning in the categories of actual filmmaking, the technical categories. So it's important to bring that to the conversation and also um, important in the art field to uh, talk about equal pay. You know, so it has come out after the Sony leaks that so many female actresses were, and female directors were making less just because they are women. So I think it's a, it's a very strong relationship between art and um, and the activism for women. And um, I have to say it's my favorite medium to bring about change. And one of the campaigns that I talked about previously, the one because of a man, was very successful because it was a cartoon. It was a drawn campaign. It really appealed to people. So a very effective uh, method of change. Thank you, Soraya. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for having me and thank you all for joining. I enjoyed your insights very much. I love this discussion and I love that it was like a two-way discussion and uh, I look forward to seeing you all again sometime. And we will be here for the rest of the week so maybe we can continue this conversation after. Thank you. And uh, just to remind, to remind you, the next session is here and it's okay. In, yeah, at five, yes, with Oksana Timofueva. Okay, thank you.